on a tranquil November in the year 2003. It seemed like all dust had settled on the Kenyan political and power dynamics space. The Kibaki government had ousted the Moi regime, was marking its first anniversary, and Moi, the octogenarian, had been left to retire peacefully at his Kabarak home. But on that evening in Kabarak, a family drama of Shakespearean proportions was unfolding. Four men sat at a table, once a family, but now about to divide. On one side, Joshua Kule, a humble and devoted servant who was family by association, but now awaiting his fate. On the other side sat two brothers and their patriarch, Philip Gideon and the patriarch, the retired President Moy. The dynamics of the relationship were far from harmonious. On one side of this familial tableau, the elder statesman viewed Joshua through a lens of unwavering trust and steadfast loyalty. For over two decades, this unassuming servant had dedicated himself selflessly to the service of none other than the former president. Through thick and thin, he had stood by his side, unwavering in his loyalty, at a time when presidential power was theirs to wield. However, on the other side of this family divide, the sons of Moi, Philip and Gideon, held a starkly different perspective. With the retirement of their father, they regarded Joshua as an unnecessary appendage to their family, a relic of bygone days, a stumbling block to the continuance of the Moi Empire. The burning question at the heart of their discord was the fate of their family's vast wealth. With the determination of youth, Philip and Gideon believed themselves to be ready to assume control over the extensive fortune that was their birthright. In their eyes, Joshua Kule's role as a guardian of the Moi Empire had drained its course. As the deliberations ensued, Joshua, the quiet and unassuming servant, remained blinded by his unwavering allegiance to President Moi. He had hoped, perhaps naively, that the retired leader would stand by his side. La, it was not to be so. Tonight, they had to part ways. The sons felt that Joshua might be hiding some wealth since he had used the ex-president's name in most of his dealings. Joshua felt that the sons were demanding more than they deserved, as they were tearing into his personal assets as well. In the end, the sons prevailed, compelling Joshua to relinquish his grasp on a staggering portfolio, over 50 business empires, shares in joint companies, and interests that he had been named a nominee. All and everything that he had faithfully safeguarded for the Moy family. The wealth, amounting to billions of Kenya shillings, was transferred to the enigmatic but secretive Samut Trust. Lo, the dream of the Moise fortune is staggering in vastness, an empire beyond quantification. Moi, a billionaire by plundering Kenya's wealth, is so prodigious that even Forbes, the herald of affluence, has named his family as the richest Kenyans, second only to the Kenyatas. The sums amassed surging into the billions of dollars rival the plunder of notorious kleptocrats like Mobutu of Zaire, Jacob Zuma of South Africa, Yaya Jame of Gambia, Ben Ali of Tunisia, and their ilk in a symphony of monumental avarice. Some parts of this vast world was known to the public, but most was shrouded in obscurity until an illuminating report surfaced. A report meticulously prepared by Kroll Associates UK Limited. This report was commissioned by the government of Kenya, who had sought the truth behind these covert transactions of the ex-president and his accomplices. However, the report was never made public. 
it was handed over to the Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission, more so for safekeeping than for prosecuting. Up to date, none of the people mentioned has ever been prosecuted or queried. Welcome to Kenya, the land of sharp contrasts. 50 billionaires, 50 million beggars. Where starting a business is harder than registering as a voter. Where justice is neither a blind nor a deaf maiden. She discerns money and hears those in power. Where politicians become overnight millionaires without ever producing, inventing, or even innovating a product. The two richest families are the families of the first and second presidents. Where financial crimes are tales we gather around to tell and listen to. Tales of fraud, tales of corruption, tales of state capture, tales of dynastic discord, tales of family feuds, tales of cyber scams, tales of crafty dealers, and the intricate webs of deceit that they weave. Today, I tell you the tale of the Moise family, the making of a klepto statement. I am Jeff Kafka. But from that night in November 2003, it is easy to see why Joshua Kulei is such an important man in revealing the layers of the intricacies of the Moise fortune. But Joshua Kulei was only one of the men that Mo used to amass a fortune unquantifiable. We shall reveal to great length all the faces that represent the jigsaw that forms the man and the wealth. Moy. Moy was hailed not merely as a professor of politics, but also a maestro of power. With skill and much, he deftly wove a tapestry of proxies bestowing rewards upon allies, mercilessly chastening those that dared dissent, all while adroitly filling his coffers with what his puppets brought in. Today, that wealth is estimated to be over $4 billion. Joshua Kulei's association with Moy predates even Moy's presidency. Joshua coined the name Baba Wataifa before even Baba was a thing. He was the heir of Moy that kept aides and loyalists afraid of him, although he was quartered as a mere personal assistant. He kept the president's purse, rewarding those that composed songs in Moy's praise and those that Mutukufu Warais wished to honor. He was one man that enjoyed being in the shadows, following Mze's philosophy, literally, Fuatanyayo. He played the unassuming underdog role with such precision and cunningness that while he served his master, he amassed his wealth on the side. He was a true subscriber to Jeshi Lamze. He only came to the limelight to criticize anyone who questioned Babu Ataifa and his leadership style. Like when he was banned from entering the USA or when appearing in a court summon. Today, Joshua Kulei spends his days quietly, minding his own business, literally. His business interests are under the sovereign group. A statement in his website states that he is one of the leading investors and employers in Kenya, with over 5,000 employees within the group's subsidiaries and its associates. His business portfolio is diverse both geographically and sectorial, spanning over eight sectors of the economy. His multimillionaire status needs no speculation. He owns a flower farm, a tea estate, America Hotel in Nakuru, the Masayo Street Farm in Kitengela, also Standard Group and Sunshine School, among others, as you can see. In an opinion I didn't expect to have, I could commend Mr. Kulei for investing in Kenya. If at all he employs over 5,000 people and each one is paid a minimum of 30,000 shillings, 
It means he's contributing 150 million shillings in salaries every month, which goes to the Monobol Kenyans. He also contributes more indirectly to the suppliers of goods and services uh, who supply to his companies and also to the government agencies. I mean, that is better than having the world stashed overseas or tied up in idle land. But let's not digress. This is financial crimes. Kulei also owns numerous properties locally, but interestingly, the Kroll report indicates that he owns property in the UK. Uh, the first property's address is 19 Eton Park, Cobham, Surrey KT 11 to JF. It's a seven bedroom freehold detached house. It is ranked as the most expensive property in that area, with a valuation of 8.8 .8 million pounds. Since it was last sold in July 2006 for 2.8 million, its value has increased by 5.9 million pounds. The second property is a flat in London, flat number 11 uh, in Lordness Square, valued at 2 million pounds. This is a critical juncture as it helps us ponder upon two things. One, if Joshua Kule transferred to the Moe's what was approximately 80% of what he held in trust for them and still remained a multi-billionaire, then how much did Joshua contribute to the Moe's fortune? What is the 80%? Second, according to one Mr. Mark Simmons, Kroll, senior consultant for Africa, in an interview with the Business Daily, he disclosed that Kroll report on the looting by Moi was only 25% of the work done. So what would be the result if they had completed the report? But how did Moi meet Joshua Kule, you ask? That will be revealed in the next part as we reveal the second phase of the men who contributed to the making of Moe's fortune, making of a klepto statesman. Subscribe, turn on the notifications, and share your views on the comment section. According to the Kroll report that was leaked on Wikileaks, we ask, 1. If Joshua Kule transferred to the Moe's what was approximately 80% of what he had held in trust for them and still remained a multi-billionaire, then how much did Joshua contribute to the Moe's fortune? What is the 80%? Second, according to Mr. Mark Simmons, Kroll's senior consultant for Africa, in an interview with the Business Daily, he disclosed that the Kroll report on the looting by Moi was only 25% of the work done. What would be the result if they had completed the report? The key people in Moi's circle were collectively able to loot billions of shillings. Some of the wealth was transformed into businesses, some is held up in land and ranches. Most of it is offshore, untraceable, unretreatable, unquantifiable. Daniel Toretti Charap Moy was born on 2nd September 1924 into the Tugen subgroup of the Kalajan people in the Rift Valley. 
Nicholas Kipiatol Kipronol Arapiwot was born on 22nd February 1940 in Chibayor, Keio District, Rift Valley. In 1955, a 31-year-old Moi was transitioning from his role as a school teacher in Sacho to take up politics. He was elected a member of the Legislative Council. In 1955, 14 year old boy Nicholas Bewart was joining Form 1 at Capsabet Boys High School. In 1960, Moy founded the Kenya African Democratic Union, KADU, as a rival party to Kenyatta's Kenya African National Union, KANU. Yani, Moy was not always KANU. Following independence in 1963, Kenyatta, who became Prime Minister and later President of the New Nation, convinced Moi to merge their two parties. So Moi used Kadu as a beginning tip to convince Kenyatta that he was bringing something to the table. In 1964, Moi was already a member of Kenyatta's cabinet as the Minister for Home Affairs. Meanwhile, 1964, Biwot was finding his footing in Australia in economics and political science, as well as a diploma in public administration. In 1967, Moy became the vice president. In 1968, Biwot completed his master's in Australia. He returned to Kenya where he would start life in the public service. First as personal assistant to Minister Bruce Mackenzie in the Ministry of Agriculture and then as senior secretary under the Ministry of Finance and Economics under the former president Moi Kibaki. In 1972, Nicholas Biwot was transferred to the Ministry of Home Affairs to work with the Vice President and Minister for Home Affairs. Daniel Arap Moy. And that was the path that fate carved up for Moy and Biwot to finally meet up. In 1972, Moy was in his midlife, enjoying life as a 48 year old second in command. Biwot was 32. Exploring life in Nairobi and along the corridors of power. This was one of the hottest joints in Nairobi back in 72. And using imagination alone, it wouldn't have been impossible to find Nick here with his old Australian wife on the VIP section, enjoying a cigar and a few drinks. Now, the two were not just colleagues in government, but tribe mates, friends, and now they were bold to form an inner circle of bros. Moy was a sharp looking man, not just the suits. Towering at 6'1", he was already physically superior to most of his peers. With an athletic body and already a tito teller, one could say that Moy already showed glimpses of greatness. He had full hair, full lips, and a moustache carefully trimmed to underline his nose. His trademark gap on his lower teeth accessorized his beauty. During that time, one of Moy's role in the Ministry of Home Affairs was to ensure humane conditions in jails as well as the welfare of the prison wardens. This meant that he received a lot of reports from the prison officials, and one of the wardens was a Kalenjin man who spoke Moi's dialect. He was a Togan named Joshua Kule Chemosian. Moi, the vice president, Biwot, his assistant at the Ministry of Home Affairs and Joshua Kulei, the prison warder from Togen. How could this bromance work, you ask? No, it, it was not a bromance between the three, but a bromance between Moy and Biwot, 
and another between Moy and Joshua Kule. But it cannot be denied that the three formed a triumvirate of modern day klepto statesmen. Joshua Kule was asked to resign from his post as a prison warder to become Moy's personal assistant, a role he gladly accepted. And to show the level of trust that Moy had in Joshua Kule, British historian Charles Hornsby, in his 2013 book, Kenya, A History Since Independence, notes that by 1997, the Kule was a director of dozens of companies, CMC Holdings, Bambori Cement, CFC Bank, NAS Airport Services, Heritage Insurance, American Life Insurance Company, Mitchell Courts, and so many others. Kule was to Moy what Bonnie was to Clyde. Bewalt was to Moy what Cleopatra was to Mark Antony. If you're keen on history, you'd know how much weight that kind of pairing holds. Moy had a wife and the mother of his eight children, Lena. But she never made it to being the first lady of Kenya. Moy would divorce her in 1974. He'll never remarry. But smoothly, he executed the role of the biggest of his on the land for the next 24 years. Well, I even have a romantic affair with a Swiss woman, as later chronicles would claim. And that was the genius of Moy. He got a trusted, loyal, no question asking, no secret selling tribesman, kinsman, a token to handle not just his cabinet minutes, but also his domestic affairs. His Brahmans, Joshua Kule. While Bewalt would be the second among equals, he would wield influence and president wealth unquantifiable, and power uncontestable. He is another fiery and mask in this web that would transcend for at least three decades. Yet, Bewalt's life and intricate schemes ascend to a realm beyond even our comprehension. He did not dwell in the obscure depths of Moy's shadow like Joshua Kule. Instead, he emerged as a forged titan, a complete embodiment of a man, a total man, and a man whose life we shall discuss in his own episode. No doubt, Bewart's influence will be felt throughout his lifetime in that of Moy. History will always record Moy as the second president of Kenya and the longest serving president in Kenyan history. But what history will not tell you is that Moy almost never became the president. It is therefore a correct adjective to infer that Moy was both prepared and lucky. But how did a young Togan teacher's fortune change from a humble beginning? to the head of state. Now, this is where Moy gets lucky. According to Gigi Kariuki in his book, Illusions of Power. Page 74, I'll quote. Such statements did not deter those determined to ensure that their choice succeeded Kenyatta, a special unit in the guise of anti-stock theft operation was set up within the police force to ostensibly eradicate cattle rustling in the country, especially in the Rift Valley. This unit came to be nicknamed the Ngoroko Squad and was organized along paramilitary lines. Kenyans were later surprised to hear that this squad was to be instrumental in seizing power by force if necessary 
in the initial stages following Kenyatta's death. The alleged plan was that if Kenyatta died in Nakuru, the vice president and those known to be close to him would be summoned to Nakuru State House, where they would be eliminated. The story would be that they had been expediently killed after murdering Kenyatta. Kenyatta died not in Nakuru, but in Mombasa on August 22, 1978. Although an attempt was made to lend credence to this plan through some publications during the early days of Moi's accession to power, no investigation was ever initiated to determine the authenticity of these otherwise dangerous rumors. Neither was the force disbanded. Going by this alleged plan, the Coast Provincial Commissioner, Eliud Mahihu, may have saved Kenya from imminent chaos. Upon learning about the death of Kenyatta, within minutes, Mahihu informed Geoffrey Karedi, the head of civil service, James Kanyotu, Director of Intelligence and Vice President Moy at his farm in Rongai near Nakuru. Karedi and Kanyotu advised Moy to go to Nairobi. According to unconfirmed reports, a well-selected contingent of the Ngoroko squad had in fact laid a roadblock between Nakuru and Rongai. Had Mahihu, Karedi and Kanyotu delayed informing Moy, possibly the course of Kenyan history would have been altered dramatically. He was tested once on 1st of August 1982 when the Air Force attempted a coup d'etat. According to historians, it was a plot by the Kikuyu and Luo leaders who were getting increasingly incensed by his leadership. The coup was thwarted by officers from the Kamba tribe. Nataka niseme kwamba yale yaliyo tokea leo asubuhi kwa muda mfupi iliyoletea wananchi wasiwazi mwingi sasa imeangamizwa na jeshi letu la nchi kafu na polisi na nawashukuru wao sana a declassified memo by the CIA notes that the onslaught of Kikuyus and Luos by Moi had started. He banned Kema, the Kikuyu Embumer Association Welfare. He banned Odinga Senior from participating in political activities. And other dictatorial measures started appearing. He detained politicians that he felt were a threat to his peace and dictated election outcomes. One case in particular, after he detained the MP for Nakuru North, now Subukia, in 1982, Koigi Wamwere, the seat fell vacant. You would expect that since the area is predominantly Kikuyu inhabited, that a Kikuyu MP would win the resulting by election. <laughs> Not in Moi's word. Kikuyu voters were turned away and intimidated with violence and Moi made sure that his man was elected, one Francis Koema Arab Kimosop. In his book, The Rogue Ambassador, by the then USA ambassador to Kenya, Smith Hempstone, Smith illustrates the blatant abuse of power, corruption, and disregard for the rule of law. Along the way in his book, he provides insightful portraits of Kenya's political class, both crafty insiders and the tragically divided dissidents. By then, Kenya was facing increasing In February 1990, a delegation led by the former Foreign Affairs Minister, the flamboyant and intelligent Robert Ouko, flew to the USA in an attempt to woo President Bush to resume foreign aid to Kenya. Uh, he was in the company of President Moy, Nicholas Biwot, and some 80 other officials. It was deemed as a private prayer meeting between President Moy and President Bush. However, what transpired after that meeting would lead to one of the darkest memories in Moy's reign. This is elaborated further in Biwot's episode. A few days later, after the delegation returned home, Huko would be found murdered 
at his Koro farm in Kisumu. I am glad to inform Kenyans that I have today ascended to the bill. A multi-party state would be introduced in 1992 to comply with the IMF demands. The first multi-party general elections were held that year and Moy, using both Hook and Crook, won the elections. He would do so again in 1997. By then, he had already written a chapter in the book, The Playbook of World Dictators. Any tyrant who comes after Moi will have more than enough nuggets to refer to. To start with, all money had his face. N not this face, but this well-chiseled, almost photoshopped bust of a handsome statesman. Then, he had all new bulletins start with him. Rais Daniel Arap Moi leo katika ikuli ya Nairobi alitoa mchango wake binafsi wa shilingi nusu milioni and his picture would linger on the TV screen for what seemed like an eternity. Moi knew how to engross himself in the brains of the dissidents. He also had a style, a strong style that was almost ritualistic. He knew how to pose for pictures. You'd never catch him in a bad photo. Then there was the rungu. Whether ceremonial or just a bad habit he picked, but he never went anywhere without the rungu. Fimbo Yenyayo. Fimbo Yenyayo. And his name? All the generations born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s knew Moi. Some, even most, thought his real name was Mtukufu Rais Daniel Toritich Arab Moi. Mtukufu Rais was stuck in everyone's mind as his name. Also, Nyayo. Children knew him as Nyayo because of Maziwa Nyayo. But this name thing had also gotten into his head. In some of his companies, the directors was listed as Hedam, H-E-D-A-M, initials for His Excellency Daniel Arapmoy. And then he named everything after himself. Start with the Nyayo philosophy that children recited at schools. Ah, oh, the Nyayo monument at Orupa, the Nyayo buses if you remember them, the Nyayo gardens. Nyayo Tizuns, Nyayo Stadium, Nyayo Pandia, Nyayo This, Nyayo That. Then the Moys. Schools, universities, streets, roads, places, hospitals, and this. And as if that was not enough, a whole day was named after him. Moy Day. Moi only vacated office in his own terms, in 2002, after 24 years as the president and with over 50 years in power. In the next and last part of this three-part series, we shall look at more faces that helped Moi to plunder family, friends, and other shit. And for the next few minutes, as you go through the list of companies and properties that the more is on, ponder and think how far in development this country would be in if these atrocities were not committed. How I wish it was all but fiction and tales that never shaped our future. But I will still uncover more for you. And I will be constantly yours, Jeff Kafka. From 
the 1970s when Moi was the vice president to 2002 when he finally retired the former president had accumulated wealth unquantifiable unquantifiable in the sense that the investigators couldn't find and or prove everything however the key people in Moi's circle were collectively able to load billions of shillings Today, we talk about family, friends, and colleagues that helped me. Moi had eight children. Nine, if we include Lee. Jennifer Chemutai Kostani, born in 1953. Jonathan Toretich. A famous rally driver. John Mark, the third born. Raymond Moy, born in 1960. Moy also had twins, Philip and Doris, born in 1962. Then there was John Moy. And lastly, Gideon Moy, born in 1964. Some sources say Lee Kinajinjui, the former Nakuru governor, was Moi's son. Those sources do not, however, elaborate further. The prominent among them were his youngest, Gideon Moi and Philip Moi. They say a chip never falls far from the old block, and it was proven so by these two. Growing up, they were not too much into the family businesses. However, over time, they started showing interest in getting directly involved in running of the Moise Empire. Like the responsible heirs they were, they brought in the techniques and the personnel that were to be the masterminds in the stealing, moving, and spending the wealth. Let's face it, they are evilly educators. Have you heard Gideon Moy speaking? She, you know, the way I looked after, or I think I looked after, and the way we all looked after Jose, my people always tell me, you know, it is how you look after your parents is how your children will look after you. They are well-traveled. They can get the audience of anyone in the world. They are exposed. Philip, for instance, was married to an Italian wife from a prominent Italian heritage. And they are ambitious, both politically and financially. Philip and Gideon control billions of dollars worth of their family's fortune. To prove themselves, they followed the three rules that every Klepo statesman has followed over time. Rule number one, obtain a bank, or many banks in this case. You will never hear that the Moise are banking with equity or family bank, no. Th that is for you, Monanji. For instance, Gideon Moy has controlled and vested interest in Jairo Bank, First American Bank, and Equatorial Banks. This allows them to bypass normal banking procedures like KYC, know your customer, and allows the movement of money from the local banks to offshore accounts in tax haven jurisdictions. The ownership of the banks had started earlier with Moyan Biwot and would be a common trick that all the perpetrators in this web of deceit will use. Moy and Biwot co-owned four banks. That was through nominees and proxy directors like the trusted Kanyotu and the loyal Kulei. There was the Middle East Bank, um, Pan-African Bank, Trade Bank, and since they were in an elite club, they also owned Bank Belogais, a bank in Belgium. Rule number two, obtain services of world-class money launderers. 
This is a no-brainer if you wish to be in the class of the top 1% of who owns the world. And not to sound opinionated towards the Indians, but it's their names that will feature prominently in this category. Rule number three, give government contracts to crooks. Here, crooks could be international business magnates or local tribal loyalists. And this is the most important part. For every contract, there must be a hefty kickback. Hefty enough for the president and crumbs to those seated at his table. And it is under rule number two that we unveil the face of a figure renowned across the globe, celebrated by critics and feared as the harbinger of illicit wealth transformation. The Moi dynasty sought only the best, and in their quest, they summoned Gabriel Musa Katri, a Swiss Israel virtuoso in the enigmatic art of concealing riches within offshore sanctuaries, creating phantom enterprises and orchestrating the clandestine dance of money from the Kenyan taxpayers to the private accounts of the Moise. But the Moise were not alone in the alliance with this notorious maestro. For other African despots, like the insidious Sunny Abbot of Nigeria, who stole over $2 billion worth of Nigerians' money, sought Katri's expertise. Musa Katri was able to make the ill-gotten billions vanish from their countries like shadows in the night. Katri wove a tapestry of complexity that defied conventional scrutiny. Instead of brazenly dispatching these riches to foreign accounts, he charted a clever course through the labyrinth pathways of Kenyan banking. Among the institutions in his networks, the Transnational Bank, an establishment already owned by the perpetrators. At Transnational Bank, Katri forged an unholy alliance with Ashok Gohil, the vigilant sentinel of Kulei's financial empire, who was strategically placed for this purpose. They created layering companies in Kenya, Asho Limited, Chan Limited, and another company known as Government of Kenya. Their puppeteers none other than Moi's legal concierge, Mutula Kilonzo, who served as the appointed director, weaving the final strands of this treacherous web. Through the obscure conduits of these banks, Nostro account, the tainted treasure flowed like a subterranean river, destined for eventual dispersal among multiple financial citadels, including the UBP. In his book, Moneyland, Alda Oliver Baller says, simply put, money is stolen from poor and unstable countries, then laundered in offshore jurisdictions and spent in a small number of wealthy, stable countries. According to Oxfam, the top 1% of the population controls 46% of the world's wealth. In other words, the richest 80 million people in the world own the same amount of stuff as the other 7.9 billion people in the world. This is a result of, among other things, hiding a country's money in offshore tax havens. That is how it is possible to have a property in London without having your name in the list of its owners or have a bank account in Jersey, which no one except you and your dealer knows about. This way, so much money leaves a developing country like Kenya and is spent in secret jurisdictions. In these jurisdictions, the perpetrators avoid taxes and legal records from the country of the source. And like everyone else, I have always wondered why the corrupt can't be forced to return what they have stolen. But the answer is simple. 
expert money launderers use a complex layering comprised of legal and financial systems to hide this wealth. In other words, even if you wanted to, you wouldn't find it. And even if you found it, you wouldn't be able to legally prove ownership. The Moyes owned property and secret accounts in all known tax havens. The Caymans, Jersey, Luxembourg, Dubai, United Kingdom, and in Switzerland, at the most prestigious private bank and wealth management firm, Union Bancaire Privé, UBP. Once these substantial sums reached UBP, flowing into accounts under country's control, they raised no suspicions. Banking regulations typically don't mandate extensive due diligence for nostro accounts, unless queries arise from the originating bank. But Catri cleverly never appeared as a signatory. Instead, small-scale lawyers and business men were used uh, for that purpose. Catri exploited his position to persuade portfolio managers to handle questionable funds directly. He oversaw multiple accounts at UBP and other Swiss banks linked to the Arbachers and the Moyes. We have already dealt with the cogs who made this fortune swell over the years. Moyes' personal assistant and loyalist, Joshua Coulet. Moyes' lesser equal and the hand of the king. Nicholas B. Watt, Moise, heirs and sons, Gideon and Philip, and Moise, money mover and schemer, Musa Katri. Now let's look at other prominent people who are mentioned. Gad Zivi was an Israeli who immigrated into Kenya from Uganda around 1974. He introduced himself to Moyan Biwot, and he introduced to Moyan Biwot the likes of Alul Kassam, a banker, and Baisman Arahoni, a state capture operative. He was and still is a civil engineer with vast experience in construction. He taught Moy and Biwot what they needed to know about the construction business. In 1978, HZ Construction and Engineering Company was created by Zevi, Biwot, and Moy. HZ is credited for most construction projects from uh, when it was incorporated up to now. But for the purpose of this podcast, the company constructed the iconic Takwell Gojizan Kerio Valley and the less iconic but nonetheless famous Yaya The Tugen Boys Club an influence on power dynamics. With that aligned, Biwot arranged for Zevi to get the contract to construct the Takwell Gorge Dam in Kerio Valley through the company that they had created, HZ Construction Company. The original cost of the contract was between 70 to 80 million US dollars, but as per rule number three of kleptocrats, the project had to be overstated. Its cost reached to 270 million US dollars, a whole 200 million dollar profit for Biwot, Moi, and Gadzevi. 200 million dollars in the 1980s. And where was the money laundered, you ask? Remember rule number one, obtain a bank. Lnul Kassam was ready with Trade Bank. Transnational Bank was also ready. 
and they had a young man to set up foreign currency accounts with international banks for purposes of laundering. Fun fact, the money laundered from 1986 to 1990 was so much that a young man who was 27 in 1990 was able to skim off close to $1 million without either Moy or Biwot knowing it. The young man, Solomon Mudamia, would later use the money to start his own bank in 1993, Eurobank. Picture this. Out of 260 state corporations or parastatals, only four are profitable. Only Kenya Ports Authority, Kenya Pipeline, Kenya Airports, and Kenzen are profitable. The others are either making losses year in, year out, like KPLC and Kenya Airways, or are on their deathbed if not already collapsed. But how is this Moi's fault? <laughs> Moy embarked on the gradual collegianization of the public and private sectors from the 1980s. Moy is a Tugi, one of the smallest Kalijan ethnic groups. He began to de Kikuyunize the civil service and the state-owned enterprises previously dominated by the Kikuyu ethnic group during Kenyatta's regime. So he appointed Kalijans in key posts in, among others, the Agricultural Development Corporation, the Kenya Commercial Bank, the Kenya Post uh, Authority, the Kenya Post and Telecommunications, the Central Bank of Kenya, the Kenya Industrial Estates, National Series and Produce Board, and all other state corporations. And since the appointments were on tribal and not intellectual basis, most of these state-owned corporations were fleeced to their deathbeds. The case of Kenya Airways and Kenya Power have been covered in previous episodes. Please check them out. But in an ironic turn of events, the CEO who helped fleece KPLC from 1983 to 2002 was a Kikuyu, one Samuel Gishoru. During Gishoru's tenure, the ministers for energy were one Nicholas Biwot and later Christana Zokemu. Kroll uncovered a business in the name of Government of Kenya, the directors of which were named as Moi, Sitoti, Okemo, Biwot, among others. This is literally true to the statement that Kenya is a company and it has shareholders. So it was black and white. They had several ways to fleece KPLC. One, Gishoro would initiate a feasibility study on a potential power generation project. The feasibility study would be conducted at a cost of around $2.7 million. And between 1991 and 1993, for instance, Gishore initiated 14 such feasibility studies, but now one project was done. And the cohort, they pocketed the money. There was the Ewasongiro power dam that was supposed to have been constructed at a cost of $350 million. The money was paid out, but no project was carried out. And in 1997, Kenya started what has now become a pocket saw so for every electricity user in Kenya. The IPPs, Independent Power Producing Companies. These companies are cartels owned by the prominent politicians and sell power to KPLC at a premium to the profit of the government of Kenya, not the country, the company. An analysis by the Auditor General in June 2023 revealed that it costs KPLC an average of 3 shillings and 93 cents per kilowatt hours of power purchase from Kenjin, while it costs KPLC an average of 11.87 shillings per kilowatt hours if they buy the power from the independent power producers. In other words, Kenjin provides cheaper geothermal power and KPLC has access to even cheaper hydro power. But KPLC instead buys power from IPPs at 200% more. Ibera Africa and Westmont Limited were the first IPPs. Guess the owners. 
Samuel Gishoru, Mohesh Gohil, a front for Moyan Biwat, Kamlesh Patni, and others. In total, Gishoru helped the system steal 20 billion shillings from the Kenyan taxpayer. And they're still doing it today. It is well documented that in South Africa, the former president, Jacob Zuma, fleeced his country billions of dollars with the help of the Gupta brothers, the Indian brothers who masterminded a full state capture. This brings to fore the question, is it that the Indians are intelligent scammers with a charm that can't be resisted? Or is it that African leaders are always looking for people that can help them still? Look at this list of Indians that the Moise used as masterminds. Mukesh Gohil, a nation from Kitale. He specialized in textile import and exports, was also in the real estate. It has been reported that Gideon has two properties in London held under a trust set up by Mukesh Kohel. The Kroll investigators uncovered up to eight properties in the UK under his name. He is also a director of four questionable companies in both UK and Australia. Mr. Habida Singh Sethi. He is a close associate to Mr. Nicholas Biwat and the Moyes and had a monopoly of contracts issued by the Ministry of Energy. He is a Kenyan occupation architect and a contractor, uh, currently a resident in Santon, Johannesburg. He moved to Johannesburg in 1997, and it has been reported that the Moyes have accounts held in South Africa and Malawi. And Sedi, the frontman for the Moyes, holds 74 properties in South Africa on their behalf. Mr. Ketan Somaya, he was well known to Joshua Kulei. He was the president's smokescreen. He controlled Equatorial Bank. Somaya in 1990 was contracted by the Kenyan government to import 500 look-alike those black taxi cabs for, from London. The cabs were worth 112 million Kenya shillings. Then. But Somaya delivered only 200 second hand vehicles, pocketing the rest of the money. In the mid 1990s, Somaya obtained 375 million Kenya shillings from the Kenyan government to supply communication equipment to the National Police Service. But he didn't. He skipped four separate summons by parliament to explain himself and fled to London to evade arrest. But good news, he was arrested elsewhere and charged and found guilty and jailed, but not on crimes concerning King. Naushad Nurali Merali listed by Forbes as the richest man in Kenya and had interest in almost all the sectors. Some of the companies he owned were in conjunction with the Moyes, Biwot and the Kenyatas, like Kensel, the First American Bank, Commercial Bank of Africa, the Wilson Airport. He's also a seasoned tenderpreneur who got the contract to supply the government with the hats to trucks. He or they made a lot of money from that. Then there was Kamlesh Patni, brother Paul. Patni entered the fold in the 90s. To understand the technological background of the Golden Bug scandal of 1991 to 1993, watch the video above. But even without going to those details, Kamlesh Patni was the architect of the most blatant theft of public money by a sitting president. See, the 1992 election was approaching. Moi needed campaign funds and money to oil his propaganda and intimidation machineries. 
He needed money to finance the likes of Kano Yudwing of 92. But let's hear it from Kamlesh himself. Born in Africa, I was born in Kenya, and I've been to nearly 80% of Africa. We had embargo on the country in 89, 90. It was dictatorship that time. Mm. It was single party. President Moni, Arab Moni. I was just 24 years old. I was buying a suit in Nairobi, and I met the director of intelligence. Uh, then I told him about gold. I said, look. There's so much gold flowing through Kenya, but it's nothing Kenya is benefiting, it's not yeah. gold. I said, well, I can create the 500 million, you know, every year from this, if you do a proper license of, of this gold. So he took me to president. Said, no, no. Wow. So I, I, know, right. I became advisor to the president, President Moy. So then he gave, uh, you know, exclusivity. Patney's company, Goldenberg International, is granted an exclusive license to export Kenyan gold. Instead, gold from what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo is smuggled into Kenya. He sells it abroad and receives a 35% commission from the government. In total, Patney pockets $600 million. It's shared with Arab Moy and the government officials who gave him the license. The biggest beneficiaries of the money was Mr. Moy, of course. From the testimonies at the Bosira report, Moy's personal assistant, Joshua was adversely mentioned as having received large sums of money. Mr. Biwot's firm, HZ Construction Limited, also received large sums of money, 600 million. Kamlesh himself indicated that he gave Kulei loads of money and vehicles for the 1992 campaign. A CBK official called Mumelo testified against Joshua Kulei, stating that he, Kulei, telephoned him, Mumelo, at CBK with a threat. Joshua Kulei asked Mumelo to stop investigating Transnational Bank, in which they were shareholders, for monies concerning the Golden Bug scandal. Mumelo would later die mysteriously. A Congolese musician, Bikasi Mandeko Bigos, testified that he was contracted by Kulei to compose songs in praise of Moi in 1992. He verified to the commission that Kulei was the Kanu campaign money bug. This clique managed to steal 158 billion of Kenyans' money. That is according to the Bosira report. The last phase that you must reveal is that of Professor Joyce Aitoti. This one scandal, the Golden Bug, tainted the image of a man widely respected for his genius and gentlemanship, a professor of mathematics and development thinker. Saitoti had more talent on his pinky finger than the rest of Moi's cabinet combined. But how he bent over to allow the Golden Bug scandal to take off is beyond me. The Bosire Commission found out that his actions were both deliberate and calculated. How does a Minister for Finance and Vice President give monopoly rights to a gold exporting company plus a 35% export compensation? Well, he knew too well that Kenya has never had any gold reserves. Saitoti knew it was all fake from inception. Saitoti, with all his intelligence, ignored warnings from ministry officials in supported Kamlesh Patni and the Golden Company. But as you can tell, it was all to please his master, Moy. Fun fact. By the end of the Golden Bug scandal, Setoti's name and image was so tainted that he'd live with that scar for the rest of his life. It was Mutavadi who was appointed to succeed Setoti at the helm of the Ministry of Finance in 1993. Mudavadi, young, that is at the time, and promising, 
had just presented the 1993-1994 budget when he went to parliament the next day for debating. It was Orengo's turn on the floor. As accolades poured forth upon the young luminary, um, today's prime cabinet minister, the fiery Ugenya MP then, James Orengo, discerned a disquieting image. Amidst their adulation, Orengo's gaze fell upon the disconcerting sight of Mudavadi, the man of the hour. Mutavadi was seated between the imposing figures of Saitoti and the diminutive but indomitable Nicholas Biwat. This was the moment when Total Man, as he had been christened, stood revered within the fortress of Kanu and cast as a paria by the possession. Orengo, in his signature audacious manner, albeit delivered with a command of oratory that could move mountains, extolled Modavadi's virtues. Yet, in the crescendo of his praise, Orengo proffered a final counsel, one laden with metaphorical weight. You are a fine and untainted man. You will go far, but only, only if you stop sitting between two hyenas. Stung by the analogy, Biwot and Saitoti leaped to their feet, invoking a point of order in a temperature's display of emotion. Moi lived a peaceful and happy life after retiring in 2002. No one in this web of shame was ever convicted of corruption, at least not in Kenya. Moi passed away on February 4, 2020, leaving a vast amount of wealth that neither we, nor Forbes, nor anyone can quantify. For the next few minutes, as you go through the list of things owned by the Moyes, ponder to think. How far in development could the country be if these atrocities were never committed? I have no more words, just pure wonder and more motives. As always, we unveil captivating tales of physical intrigue where shadows dance with wealth, a clandestine league. The epic saga unfolds, a poetic trip through the weave, interesting financial crimes, secrets they never leave. But I will be constantly yours, Jeff Kafka. <laughs>